Kneel before Zod! You can't go! All the plants are gonna die! I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil! Don't touch it! The name's Pliskin. No! Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we'll be discussing All Night Long, released March 6th, 1981. It was written by W.D. Richter, directed by Jean-Claude Tremont, and released by Universal Pictures. The working title was Night People. <laughs> Sounds like a horror film. It does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this film ended Gene Hackman's two-year retirement from acting after shooting Superman and Superman 2. But weirdly, in America, this actually came out before Superman 2. I have to wonder what about this script could possibly have enticed him out of retirement. Production began with Hackman and actress Lisa Eichhorn as Cheryl Gibbons. Four weeks into the film, Eichhorn stepped away on account of artistic differences. Still collecting her $250,000 salary for the film. Wow. Yeah. Reportedly, there were difficulties between Eichhorn and the director, and also a lack of chemistry with Gene Hackman. If what Hackman and Barbara Streisand have is chemistry, I can't imagine what those first four weeks looked like. Yeah. Streisand was allegedly paid $4 million. What? And 15% of the gross for appearing in this film. Hackman refused to come to set until the pay disparity was addressed. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, nice to see it the other way around for yeah, once. that's crazy. <laughs> Rumors abound that Streisand was brought on because her agent, Sue Mengers, was the wife of the director, and when the film bombed hard, Streisand fired her. An actor strike five days from the end of shooting, doomed to the studio's plans of releasing it in December of 1980, in time for Hackman's performance to be considered for the Academy Awards. Okie dokie. After multiple disastrous test screenings, 20 full minutes were removed from the film. <laughs> Thank God. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they could have done it with another 20, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. But maybe that's why none of it makes any sense. That's possible. <laughs> we open at an office building where George Dupler, played by Gene Hackman, is learning that he's been passed over for a promotion and suddenly we see a chair thrown through the window of the building. We learn from comments later that after throwing the chair, George attacked his boss, but amazingly, due to his seniority, instead of being fired, he's being transferred out of corporate to a night manager position at one of the company's brick-and-mortar locations, an ultra-save grocery store. This makes total sense. Right, you would totally do this. He asks a cashier for directions to the manager's office because apparently they're in different places at every grocery. No, they're always in the same place, upstairs in the back. He meets with the day manager who tells him what kind of maniacs he can expect on the night shift. He warns that people will try to rob the pharmacy and he gives George a gun. He also warns George not to count on the security guard because a man came in once with a razor trying to kill the cashier or register girl as he calls her. He froze like a December turd in Lake Erie. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it myself. You had to do what? Put him away. I think that means kill, right? <laughs> I mean, I would... It sounds like he means kill. Yeah. Also, and, and, and I don't know if maybe I missed it, because I was <laughs> maybe wasn't giving this movie my full attention, but the, the guard that he's pointing to isn't the guard that we have the rest of the movie. No, it's not. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's weird. Because Russell is definitely not that guy and i don't remember a scene of him hiring russell no i don't either okay must be in that missing 20 as they walk the aisles of the store together george's son freddie stumbles in and the day manager mistakes him for a problem customer he seems drunk and his shirt is completely unbuttoned he informs his father that mike gibbons just died mike yeah dropped dead at a pta meeting well how i don't know brain hemorrhoid <laughs> that's the last laugh of the movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> are we going to address the uh age of his son no I, I, what what is what is his age would you guess he's supposed to be 18 i think i guess yeah 
Yeah, at some point they He does say that, they that, say that he's, that 18, he's 18, 18 at one yeah. point. Yeah. But he certainly doesn't look it. Yeah. Dennis Quaid looks like he's 40. <laughs> I think you're just thinking that because you know Dennis Quaid is a 40-year-old. He definitely looks like he's in his mid twenties, which I I mean I don't know. He played a teenager in Gorp and we didn't think it was crazy. I guess. I don't know. He was he was sh- his hair was like shaven down like he he looked more like a kid in that maybe we cut immediately to mike's funeral or maybe a reception after the funeral in a backyard george goes to speak with mike's grieving parents and informs them that he is married to their widowed daughter-in-law's sister helen helen pulls george away and tells him not to bother these grieving people before taking that space herself and wasting their time introducing the rest of the family I definitely had to pause for like a few moments and figure out what these family relationships were. They're trying too hard to obscure it because the right. point is sp- they they want to distance these characters from each other familially so it doesn't seem like an incest comedy. Well, I mean, because that's basically what it is. It's like, oh, it's your your uncle's sister or your uncle's wife or whatever it is. Yeah, but they, they use like, way too many words to right. describe their relationship. <laughs> like, it's not that complicated. Yeah. George heads to talk with Mike's brother, Bobby and offer his condolences while they chat george notices bobby's wife cheryl played by barbara streisand and asks who she is it's my wife cheryl thank you <laughs> she, she looks different she is different i mean there's no one quite like her within 20 miles of here i have all i can do to keep up with her bobby tells george that his son is a terrific house painter apparently they hired him to paint a bedroom in their home and he was quick and efficient he points george inside the house to see the room George sits on a waterbed in the room and picks up a phone to call Mr. Schuster, the boss that he attacked in the office building. He notices through the doorway that Cheryl is being flirtatious with his son, Freddie, in the kitchen, and he grabs her ass as she walks by. At work that night, the cashier asks for help repairing a register, and George fixes it right away, even though he has no experience with cash registers or anything. Well, I'm assuming that this is, like, weeks maybe this yeah. like but I, she's been there since before he started so yeah. she should know how to fix this register agreed i guess it's just to indicate that he's technical because we'll get a lot of that yeah huh. i didn't put any of that together <laughs> the next day freddie is sanding the paint off his truck while his father sleeps during the day over breakfast george asks his son directly if he's in a relationship with cheryl your mother's sister's Late husband's brother's wife. <laughs> the script puts so much effort into obscuring the relationship between the characters, but there's a faster way to say your mother's sister's late husband. It's just your late uncle. Right. <laughs> That's all you had to say. And brother's wife is a sister-in-law, so he could have just said your late uncle's sister-in-law. Meaning that to George, Cheryl is his brother-in-law's sister-in-law. Freddie makes no excuses and admits to the affair, and they both laugh about Freddie charging Bobby to paint a room in their house while he's banging Bobby's wife. George warns Freddie against pursuing this relationship, but Freddie says that she's lonely because Bobby's a firefighter and he works nights. And besides, he thinks he's in love. That night, George catches a shoplifter from his office upstairs. He heads down to follow the man until he is approached by Cheryl Gibbons, who walked into the store in the middle of the night. George calls security on the shoplifter, but eventually has to take out the guard himself by hitting him with a shopping cart so that he doesn't shoot a crazy person in the middle of the store. There's honestly no reason for Cheryl to be here at the store other than the screenwriter needed these two characters to bump into each other. Because mm-hmm. they've had no interaction right. before. They've never least. spoken to each other once, and it's not organic that her excuse is just, I'm here because Freddie is upset that you told him not to date me. And there's no reason that he would send her here to smooth things over. Like, she's never talked to him before. We also already knew Freddie was upset, so we're not learning anything either. It's just an excuse for these two people to be in the same room. Apparently, Cheryl has shown up during George's lunch break, and they go to get food together at the diner across the street. George tells Cheryl that Freddie is a minor, and then immediately contradicts himself. Freddie's a minor, Mrs. Gibbons. Does that mean I could go to jail? That's not the point. He's only 18 years old. Oh, well, then he's not a <laughs> he's minor. He's not a minor. And yes, if he were a minor, you would go to jail. Yeah. It's like the film wanted him to be a minor, but they didn't want Cheryl to be a felon. So they were just like, he's a minor and he's 18. <laughs> Walking back to the store after their meal, Cheryl tells George that she read an article 
about how people working graveyard shift are the new pioneers like living in the wild west <laughs> what which i gotta say i've worked graveyard shift and aside from the sleeping difficulty it's way easier than working daytime because you don't have to deal with yeah people. <laughs> everybody's super chill at night she lies more to george about how amazing he is you live a very exciting life because you live on the edge i admire that i admire you she must have just seen him at the funeral party and thought he was cute and made a bad excuse to come meet him because none of this makes any sense. She leans forward to kiss him out of nowhere, crediting his life-saving actions in the store earlier, and then they kiss again. The next night at home, George fiddles with a remote control vacuum for a moment. Yeah, um, the only thing that I liked about this was that um, the vacuum cleaner actually went side to side. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's actually impressive. It doesn't just doesn't just go forward and you have to turn it. It can actually go but side to side. I don't think it goes forward. I think it only goes side to side. Oh, that's okay. That's just as useless. <laughs> Which is just a vacuum put on top of an RC car, basically. Mm-hmm. Plus it wasn't plugged in. Right. <laughs> that was the big thing. Helen suggests he apologize to Mr. Schuster to get his office job back. The most interesting thing in this long, drawn-out scene is the news broadcast in the background describing an incident with a palm tree trimmer who accidentally cut his safety straps and plummeted to his death from a tree. That distracts from everything they're saying to each other. <laughs> I completely missed that, by the way. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. I, that was I, I, all I, I was yeah. listening to. George tries to see Schuster again at the office without an appointment, but can't get in to see him. We cut to George and Cheryl having dinner together at her house. The tenuous explanation for this scene is that George intended to return her lighter, and now they're sitting down to a meal together? Yeah. Did he borrow a lighter from her? He did. Um, she tried to light a cigarette in their first lunch meeting, and it wouldn't light. And so, so he lit it and pocketed her lighter. No, he didn't light he it. He was going to fix it? Yeah, he, he's going to fix it. And she says, I wanted to quit anyway. Uh, okay. Uh, but now he's returned her lighter fully repaired. And she cooked a full meal for them. Mm, I wouldn't say <laughs> Yeah, she meal is a strong meal. word. Yeah, I was going to say meal, huh? Okay. There's no chemistry between these people. And the food looks fucking gross. It's basically shit on a shingle, but without meat. It's just two cans of soup poured on toast. Well, she said it was it was basically a tuna casserole, but on toast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But she credits Bobby with having taught her the recipe, but it can't have taken very long to teach. It's just like, open two cans, dump on toast. Well, <laughs> but it's the kind of soup that you have to add water to. And she says, I just didn't add, a, add the water. So she did even less work. <laughs> but it, it reminded me of... Liz Lemon's cheese chowder, where it's like, oh, I, just, I just take a can of soup, and instead of water, I substitute cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad. The whole conversation is very forced with bizarre segues. It really feels like whoever wrote it, like English was not their first language, but it turns out that that's probably the director, not the, not the writer. Your wife must be a good cook. Why? Because I'm not enthusiastic about this garbage that you made? <laughs> <laughs> She really, she tries very hard to organize our lives. She uh, plans everything very carefully. What does that have to do with cooking meals well? What do you, why did you bring that up? Like planning to have one kid, you mean? What? What is, what is this conversation? I don't get it. I feel bad for the actors that have to try and make this feel organic. But honestly, they're not trying that hard. It seems like Streisand is literally angry about every line that she has to say. Nobody plans to have somebody like Freddie. I did. You plan to have a kid exactly like Freddy? Is that why you're fucking Freddy? <laughs> what? Ugh. I don't. I don't understand why. Like, what is her comment? Yes, I. I was planning to have a kid exactly like your son. What does that mean? Well, Are I you going to take him? She chose him. Is what she's saying. Is she? She actively chose him. It. She makes it sound like she wanted a kid that was like him because the very next line is her saying that her husband wouldn't let her have children. Yeah, it's, it's like as lovers or weird. as children. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe your husband is right because yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't be having sex with children. <laughs> 18 year olds. George spills food in his lap and Cheryl takes his jacket to clean it. She invites him to see the paint job that Freddie did, which he's already seen. And it happens to match the pajamas that she wore to their date for some reason. Also, most of the food doesn't land on his jacket. It's on his shirt. Right. And, like, and in his lap. Yeah. And in his lap. I'm like, I'm glad you're cleaning the jacket off. He tries to escape the situation amicably, but she invites him to test out the waterbed. 
Why did you come here to this woman's house for dinner if you were so concerned with being an upstanding husband? She tells George that things are probably ending between her and Bobby, and then they hear a siren outside, and Cheryl tells George how she worries for her husband. He asks her to stop talking about him, and she apologizes, but so much that it almost sounds sarcastic that she's apologizing. Oh, there I go again, being so insensitive. You poor baby. <laughs> yeah. The doorbell rings, and he asks if she's expecting anyone. At four in the morning? Who would she be expecting this early other than someone returning a lighter, which typically <laughs> happens between 2 and 3 a.m.? <laughs> For whatever reason, she ignores the sound for a while, assuming the person will just leave. Like, who knocks at 4 o'clock? And then it's just like, well, I guess they're not home. And then turns around and leaves. <laughs> or they're asleep because it's 4 in the morning. Yeah. She assures George that it's probably nobody at the door. <laughs> it can't be anybody. She finally moves to answer the door, and it's Freddy. She tells him to leave, and he makes weird animal sounds at the door until she opens it and lets him into the apartment. Or the house, I guess. He notices the half-eaten meal and realizes that he's not her only gentleman suitor tonight. George manages to sneak out without getting caught, and the next morning, Helen and her friends are taking French lessons downstairs while George tries and fails to go to sleep. Freddie comes in sobbing because apparently Cheryl just flat out told Freddie that George was the other guy. What was the point of him sneaking away unseen last night if she was just going to tell him right afterward? Yeah. Freddy tells Helen that George is cheating on her with Aunt Cheryl. George makes no effort to apologize and instead complains to Freddy about what he's doing to Helen by sharing this information. George at least admits fault for their affair, but he also tries to take the blame for unemployment, inflation, and the Vietnam War, so it's clear he doesn't think that he's responsible for anything that's happened. He packs up his stuff and walks out, claiming not to understand his wife or son because of their bizarre actions, like being upset that he cheated on his wife with his son's girlfriend. Now he's blaming pollution for his actions. I don't know if there's not enough gas or too much sun, not enough atomic energy or too much nuclear waste. What the fuck are you talking about? No. Is this like in Last Mary Couple when Richard Benjamin is blaming his divorce on police strikes and condominiums? <laughs> Just random buzzwords that an audience would automatically laugh at, regardless of whether they made any sense. Of all the divorce comedies we've covered so far, this one spends the least time trying to make us sympathize with the cheating husband. George drives across town to check into the Maryland Hotel. In the lobby, a man is being wheeled out in a stretcher for some reason. Well, I think they're trying to show that there's a vacancy. Yeah. <laughs> Something just opened up. The bellhop escorts George to his room, where he strips everything off the bed because the maid was hospitalized with spinal meningitis. The man expects a huge tip despite throwing everything on the floor and not taking any of the mess with him. George steps to the window to peek through the blinds as a car accident can be heard outside, and it's just, I guarantee you that happened in the edit. They were like, how can we make this funnier? Put in a car crash sound. I was like, why? Because car crashes are funny. It's a bad neighborhood and all mm -hmm. that. Because car crashes happen all the time in bad neighborhoods. Only in bad neighborhoods. At work that night, George wanders into the pharmacy area in search of uppers. When the pharmacist refuses to indulge him, he sneaks a couple pills out of the machine himself, and the pharmacist reminds him that they could go to jail for doing this, but George doesn't seem to care, and it never comes back. I would say sneaks a strong word. He just walks up and takes them. Yeah, he pushes <laughs> the button and scoops them out like they're candy. He calls his wife about some mail that he received from her attorney. He's very dismissive of her complaints about him. Are you okay? You sound weird. Hold on. I sound weird because I am weird. <laughs> That's such a weird line. But again, now he's been at this place long enough to start receiving mail. I guess, From, from yeah. an attorney. Um, I have my own theory about this going forward. Yeah. Uh, but I'll wait till the to the scene that occurs later. Okay. He was dead the whole time? That's right. <laughs> Night people. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time, he denies the accusation that he slept with his son's girlfriend. Why couldn't he have bothered to do this sooner? Who knows? I guess we needed him to look like a good guy getting falsely accused of something, but never denying it for no reason. 
He tries to convince her that they don't need to bring attorneys into their disagreement when he notices Cheryl entering the store again on a security camera. The cashier directs Cheryl to his office, and she has to explore around a while before she finds him hiding in a cabinet. George tells Cheryl that he got thrown out of the house, and she's like, oh, why? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> maybe because you told my son that we made out last night. Yeah. Do you think that that might be connected? She tells George that he's just confused because he's trying to control his feelings. I don't know what that means. In the same breath, she tells him that it would be the end of her marriage if Bobby found out what they'd done. George starts an argument with men doing construction in the store and tells them to leave, but they don't. They just keep working. Could you hold the goddamn, goddamn hammering? hammering? <laughs> Back at the register, a woman pulls a gun on a cashier and tries to rob the store. When the guard tells George that the gun isn't loaded, he tries to take it away from the woman with his hands, but she's so huge that she puts him in a headlock and throws him over a candy display. For some reason, Cheryl joins the fight with this woman. They start a tug-of-war with the woman, and she's whipping at them with chains, but when they let go of her, she flies backward into an open freezer, knocking herself out. Is there a reason that this store goes to shit every time Cheryl comes, or is this just a coincidence? <laughs> is she hiring these people to do this? Even though they're not in a relationship, according to their own opinions, George and Cheryl go back to George's apartment, where they find a note from the previous tenant in the room. This has to be part of the 20 minutes that got taken out. Yeah, because they um, this person is in the credits. And he was on the stretcher. Yeah. That's the guy that they rolled out. And he had a jacket, a leather mm -hmm. jacket, that he left in the room when he was taken out forcibly by EMTs and evicted simultaneously because he doesn't have this apartment anymore. I, I think you default on your apartment if you're taken out for any medical reasons. I guess. In this universe. At this yes, hotel. just in this universe. Who gave the previous tenant access to this room to leave a note in it? He still and has it, the key. They, they mentioned that. that he oh, still okay. has the key. So he kept the key. Because that's why they said they, they can't start anything because, um, I, I can't remember, that. it's a Native American person's name. Yeah. He says he has the key, has the key. Because so, uh, it, it's a callback to something that he said earlier to Cheryl when they heard Freddie knocking. Yeah. Because he's like, well, Bobby has a key. And, and so he makes the same kind of joke that, this, that person, this other person has a key. Yeah. But also, he's looking for a leather jacket, which, unless George stole it or sold it, wouldn't it have been in the room where the guy left it? And if it's not, where is the jacket? Like, there's so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> that aren't relevant at all. This movie is the closest I've come to quitting this podcast since <laughs> Nothing Personal last year, because nothing makes any sense. I don't know if it's just because 20 minutes got taken out and they spaced it all over the place so that none of the jokes make any sense. It's not just you, though. It was infuriating yeah. that nobody had any logical motivation for anything that they said. Out of nowhere, with no relevance to the scene, Cheryl says, There was a man who cried because he had no shoes until he met a man who had no feet. Impossibly, George has never heard the saying... <laughs> <laughs> and asks if she thought of it herself. <laughs> Weirdly, he doesn't ask to think why she said it, because it has no bearing on anything. They kiss again for some stupid reason, even though they're both fucking stupid and obnoxious people. They sit on George's couch together, and she tells him about her dreams of composing music. She asks George what he would be if he could be anything, and he says, an inventor. Which is usually, in a movie, what a dumb person says. Like, I want to be an inventor. And the mm -hmm. joke is because they're terrible at everything. And this is no exception. But, like, I guess I missed the cues up until this point that indicated that this is what he would want you to do. You barely missed the cues. I, because he, he fixed the cash register and he <laughs> played with a vacuum. That's it. Yeah, yeah but it was just like, oh, I had no idea that was of interest to you. You just seemed like a grumpy old man. They turn off the lights as George carries Cheryl away from the couch and presumably they have sex. So now he's done the thing that everyone already thought he did and completely erases any possible irony of him being accused of a thing he didn't do. We cut to Helen's attorney's office where he's presented with the details of their divorce agreement. George signs the divorce agreement and hands it back to the attorney without consulting an attorney of his own. So now his marriage is over and there's really nothing interesting left for the rest of the story to revolve around. He's not even cheating anymore. He divorced his wife mm -hmm. so that he could see this woman. He's just an idiot in a relationship with a married idiot, and he works at a grocery store. That's the whole story now. In the grocery store that night, 
an employee and the security guard are reading the instructions for an RC helicopter that they bought for security purposes. Is this I a guess. security drone for the store? Well, I don't think they bought it. Didn't he say it was a gift from his mom who was like in the military or something? Like it was a weird thing. I don't know. <laughs> it says police on the side of it though. Yeah, I thought I thought it said army. Oh, Did it say ma- police? I can't remember. Well, either way, like the the security guard guy, I thought said like my mom's in the yeah my mom's in the military and she gave it to me as a gift or something. <laughs> but he's he it seems like he intends to use it as a security option for the store, even though it's really not a drone because it doesn't have a camera on it. All it is is a remote control helicopter. Yes. All you can use it for well, is scaring people around the store. In 1981, that's what qualified as a drone, though. They didn't understand yet. Okay. It was gas powered too. Was it really? Mm-hmm. The cashier gives George a heads up that some corporate bosses are waiting in his office. They tell him that they're adding a copy center to the store and they threaten to fire him for not being excited about it. So he quits because he's dumb and he doesn't know how unemployment works or pensions or anything. Just fail at your job until they fire you and take the money, you idiot. <laughs> and how you all know Patrick's strategy. Yeah. Of life. <laughs> That's how we pay for this podcast. <laughs> For some reason, they act like they can't just get another random employee out of the store to be the manager tonight, and they follow him step by step out of the store, demanding that he come back to his post. Well, like, this doesn't make any sense to me, because I feel like we started the whole, this whole thing, like, he got fired from his job, and I feel like, well, he didn't get fired. He got demoted to this store because they didn't want to fire him, because they didn't want to, like, get in trouble because he had so much yeah. seniority. So they're I, The like, whole point was for him to right, quit. we'll demote you to the point where you're not a problem for us anymore. Why on earth would they care if he left? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Isn't that solving their problem? On his way out, the guard gets the RC copter in the air, and George grabs the remote to pantomime dropping bombs on the two men from corporate. He swings the chopper low over their heads, and we hear bombs exploding in the soundtrack. Eventually, he hands the controls back to the guard and walks out. Nothing, there's no point to this scene. We cut to Cheryl's house, where she's playing the organ in her living room while her husband tries to make a phone call. It's a hilarious joke because she's a very bad singer, despite in real life being a very good singer. And it's not fun to listen to bad singing. One of the best new songwriters in the business. Tickling the ivories tonight. Yours truly, Cheryl Gibbons. It was lying, it was lying in the gutter, broken, twisted. She's basically just Vicky St. Elmo from MacGruber, except that it's not funny, it's just bad. And annoying because her husband is on the phone in the background trying to make a business deal. And he can't hear the person he's trying to talk to over her music. He shouts at her to quiet down, and she does for about five seconds, and then starts right back into the song. And he shouts at her again, and this time she's indignant. Cheryl! Cheryl, I I can play too! No, I asked you. I honestly don't know if we're supposed to think he's a bully here, but basically, she's just being a cartoon child of a moron. It's making her look like an idiot. Outside, in the middle of the day, George is literally standing in their planter, peeking in the window while she plays the organ. He rings the doorbell multiple times before she bothers to answer it. She's surprised to see him there and tries desperately to keep him away from Bobby, even though she didn't hesitate to tell his son Freddy about their relationship. Bobby is building a brick wall in the backyard, and so George just walks right up to him to talk about nothing. Since the movie has somehow confused Bobby for a bad guy, the joke of this scene is that George keeps knocking over parts of the wall that Bobby is actively putting together. Bobby is just a hardworking firefighter who works graveyard shift, and seems to do construction part-time to help make ends meet, and his wife is cheating on him with this idiot. I mean, he's not totally innocent in this movie. Is he not? He's a dick to his wife. When was he a dick to her? I didn't. I missed that scene. Uh, when I think it's I actually think it's this scene, the, when he like makes her go and get them drinks, and um. I don't remember him doing anything terrible. No, he's not nice to her. Okay. I mean, he shouted at her to stop playing the piano, too. Yeah, which, I, mean, like... I would do that, too, if you were playing the piano that loud while I was fucking talking on the phone, <laughs> trying to make a business deal to pay for our lifestyle. I know. I'm just saying, like, he's not nice about these things. Yeah, but they're they're doing, they're you know, in Hook, 
when he's on the phone trying to make a $5 million business deal and the kids are running in circles around him screaming. And then he's like, can you guys shut up for a second? I'm on the phone making a $5 million deal. (laughs) And all the other adults in the room are like, whoa, what an asshole. He just yelled (laughs) at his kids. And it's like, no, you're supposed to keep these kids out of the room. You play the piano after I hang up. But it just seems like he's being made out to be the bad guy when all he's doing is working 24 hours a day and his wife is cheating on him. Suddenly, George remembers a thing and says it out loud for some reason. Curtis P. Fields. The forgotten art of building the stone wall by Curtis P. Fields. Of all the people I know, you should read that. I mean, you can read it in an afternoon, dude. You should pick that up. I'll pick it up for you. Oh, I remember. He's also a dick in the scene later um, at the anniversary dinner. After he finds out that he's been cheated on. No, I think beforehand. Isn't it? No, I think I think he's he freaks out when he when he's confirmed that he's being cheated on. Mm. All right, maybe. Again, I didn't pay as close attention to <laughs> yeah. this movie as I probably should have. It was very frustrating. <laughs> George knocks over another section of the wall, and Bobby is understandably frustrated as he begins to reconstruct it. In case anyone cared, and I'm sure you don't, this is a real book. Curtis P. Fields is a real person who wrote a book about building a wall that the screenwriter knew about for some reason and thought it was important to jam into this scene. Bobby walks across the yard to gather supplies for the wall, and while he's away from them, Cheryl asks George why he's doing this, as if she didn't already do this to him earlier in the movie. George takes this opportunity to ask who's better at having sex with her, him or his son, which is a completely ridiculous and gross question to ask. She says that he was better, but then corrects herself to say, well, you were at least more mature, which I think is just code for saying, well, you weren't better than him, but you were older than him. (laughs) For some reason, throughout this entire scene, Bobby never thinks to ask what the fuck George is doing here at all. Later, we see George walking with a woman through a warehouse full of Koreans painting mountains in a classroom setting, and she leads George to the next room. 4,000 square feet, give or take. It's a warehouse, and he's going to use this as a home slash inventing room, I guess. We've literally only seen him make that one stupid remote control vacuum before this, and I don't think we'll see him invent anything else for the rest of the film. Uh, but he he'll, has... he'll invent one thing, but it was already a thing, so... Oh, right, yes, yeah. A remote control vacuum, by the way, is a shitty idea because it doesn't actually help you vacuum things. It's just a slightly harder way to control a vacuum than a stick connected to the vacuum. It's not like a remote controlled lawnmower. Yeah. He tells his future landlady that he's an inventor, even though he's not, and he hasn't invented anything. Well, you got your work cut out for you. Because nothing they got now gets the job done. And... I guess the joke of that was that she was resetting a mousetrap. Right. And I assume that that meant he was going to build a better mousetrap. Right. right. But, but he doesn't. no, that doesn't do that. <laughs> Although I would most like him to invent this mousetrap, but it's just the game mousetrap. Yeah. Oh, this is great. <laughs> we cut to George arriving at a Gibbons family anniversary party. It's the couple's 40th anniversary, which means that today they'd be hitting their 80th. The 80th anniversary, by the way, doesn't actually have a traditional gift associated with it. (laughs) What's the 40th? Well, Diamond is the 60th anniversary, but in the U.S., the next and last anniversary gift is the Moonstone anniversary, which is the 85th. So you literally have to go to the moon to get a (laughs) gift for that anniversary? I don't know why you have a gift for an 85th anniversary, but not for the 80th. Like, if you make it past 60 years, you have to wait 25 more years. In the UK, the 80th is oak, which seems weirdly cheap. (laughs) George's ex-wife, Helen, notices him at the party and inexplicably offers to make him a plate of food like he's a fucking child or something and not a person that she's divorced from. She steps away to make him food and as she leaves, George bumps into Cheryl and Bobby again. It seems like Cheryl has told Bobby everything because Bobby looks angry And he tells Cheryl to go get George a plate of food like his ex-wife just got up to do. So now his ex-wife and someone else's wife are both making him plates of food at the buffet. George notices Freddie's new girlfriend and hits on her briefly. Cheryl encounters her cousin Helen at the buffet and asks Helen what her ex-husband likes to eat so she can make a plate for him. Does he like baked beans? This is ridiculous for a bunch of reasons. One of them is that Helen's already making a plate for him. 
The other, what kind of a monstrous asshole do you have to be to bother a woman whose husband you stole for pointers on feeding him? And everyone likes baked beans. Yeah, that was my third, <laughs> that was third that's point. my third point. <laughs> Helen is rationally offended by the question, and Cheryl insists that she's just a gigantic moron and not intentionally malicious. She's lying, though. She's only asking Helen what George likes to piss her off. And here's my proof. Who the fuck doesn't like <laughs> baked beans? After Helen walks away, Cheryl begs him to dance with Helen because otherwise she'll think that he was just here to see Cheryl. And he readily admits that's exactly why he came. He wants to take Cheryl away from all this, but he also wants her husband and his ex-wife to see it happen because he's a fucking asshole. He could have done this any other time of the day, but he decided to do it when both of their significant others were around. They move to sit down at the table with everyone else, and George entertains them with an invention he's developed for a mirror that shows you exactly how you appear to other people instead of flipped horizontally. I had no idea what the heck he was talking about yeah. here until It's literally I, just a mirror in a 90 degree yeah, angle. Yeah, I get yeah. that now, but it took me forever to be like, what do you, like, what, what? It's a mirror that shows you what you look like? Yeah, that's all mirrors. Oh, yeah. wait, to other people? Isn't that still all mirrors? <laughs> yeah, it's the it's like that new TikTok trend where people are like, oh, flip horizontal. Oh, that's what I look like to other people? Yeah. Like people are disgusted by it for some reason. It would just be a mirror that makes you look less attractive to yourself. <laughs> Perfect. I'll take five. <laughs> <laughs> Point them at each other as revenge. No, what happens if you mirror a mirror? Cheryl makes the idiotic suggestion that he could call his mirror the Duppler, and he repeats it under his breath like it's brilliant and not just his own fucking name. <laughs> not to mention the non-reversing mirror was patented by John Joseph Hooker in 1887. <laughs> Bobby flips out about Cheryl and George's obvious flirting and starts throwing things around and knocking over food and drink. I want you to admit here in front of my whole family that you're fooling around with my wife. Actually, I think most of them already know. I didn't know. Who? Cheryl. George grabs Cheryl by the arm and drags her out of the party. And and and, and point of order, uh, George is not having an affair with his wife. His wife is having an affair with George because George is That's not true. Married. Yes, yeah. Bends the rules. <laughs> George grabs Cheryl by the arm and drags her away from the party, and everyone else holds Bobby back to avoid a fight breaking out. George takes her back to his warehouse apartment, and they act like she just automatically divorced her husband by leaving the party, and there's nothing to worry about now. George asks where he met her anyway, and she says he saved her from a fire, <laughs> making him an even more sympathetic character than he already was. Cheryl feels a little guilty about ditching her husband after everything he's done for her, including saving her life from fire and providing for her financially with his love and working 24 hours a day. And George responds to this guilt with a lot of narcissistic bullshit. Will you stop letting people push you around? Stop feeling sorry for people? Put your foot down? Yeah, dummy. Stop feeling sorry for people just because you cheated on them and they loved you and saved you. Amazingly, it's that simple. She doesn't feel guilty anymore about cheating on her husband with this oblivious jerk. All she's worried about now are her albums and books and sheet music. George offers to replace everything with the money he makes at his no job, <laughs> renting a 4,000 square foot apartment and paying alimony on a waiter's salary. That's his new job, by the way, when he's not inventing, which he's not. <laughs> <laughs> he's stealing, I guess, technically. <laughs> Now that oh, both people wait, have... Hold on. Well, when was that patent again? Maybe it's the, pat the patent's expired. They ran out? Yeah. <laughs> do they? Do they run out? Now that both people have broken it off with their spouses, they are free to do whatever they want, and the story is over. <laughs> There's literally no conflict left, so we can just cut to credits now. But instead, Cheryl gets really mad all of a sudden for no reason, so the movie has an excuse to last 90 minutes instead of 70 minutes. Her complaints don't make a lot of sense. She mentions that he lives in a warehouse with a bunch of Koreans... And that he only has one pillow, as if those were deal breakers. Um, Although I did thing, say that yeah. they, that was a deal breaker. It is a deal breaker. But he can buy another <laughs> pillow if he can buy her new sheet music. Right. <laughs> but earlier she was cool staying with him at some seedy hotel that strangers had the keys to. And now she's being all uppity about this huge apartment. Bobby and Freddie go to visit George at the restaurant where he works. Yeah. I, I was like, wait, why is Bobby and freddy together why are they teaming up they yeah. came here in bobby's car together because it because all of a sudden freddy isn't on bobby's side right immediately yeah 
Bobby asks George where his wife is, and weirdly George's answer is that she's safe, <laughs> like he's holding on to her as a hostage. <laughs> I got a picture of her with today's newspaper. <laughs> Relax. If you give me the money, everything's going to be fine. Instead of participating in the scene. I recommend the cashew chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Obscure reference, folks. <laughs> it's okay. I don't get it either, guys. Don't worry. Instead of participating in the scene, Gene Hackman just sort of wanders away and starts singing with the performers on stage at the restaurant. Eventually, Bobby is thrown out of the restaurant, and Freddy thinks this is hilarious, even though they came here together, presumably as a team. George gives Freddy a ride home, and inside, he finds Helen having a candlelit meal with her attorney. So this is... Here's the rest of your theory. This is the rest of my, rest of my theory, is that Helen was already having an affair with this man. Bef- before he even met Cheryl, probably? Correct. That makes sense. Um, that, cause, but they don't imply that in this cut of the film. No, it's not really implied except in this when he asks for a cup of coffee and he says, oh, he knows where the oh, well, coffee yeah, cups are. Yeah, I have my complaints about that line here. Like, So that he's been to this house enough times within the span of this. Uh, th- this is what I was that's taking the, Yeah, that, I think I, that is the implication, but that's not what I get from it. And and I and I guess it's to make him see more things like sympathetic again that he was it was okay for him to have had an affair because she was having one but the way the film is cut he had an affair and then she started dating her attorney after they were divorced correct so what she's doing isn't remotely wrong helen asks george what he's doing here and he answers that this is his house but is it i don't no, know what that it's document not. they says. got divorced and he signed away everything <laughs> George suddenly thinks that he can demand answers from his ex-wife and her new boyfriend about their relationship. George, you have absolutely no right. I have every goddamn right in the world. Everybody's been trying to nail me for something, and now the goddamn tables are turned. No, George. You cheated on your wife, she divorced you, and she's seeing a new person. They've literally done nothing wrong. I really think the screenwriter is on George's side of this disagreement, and it makes me so angry. Freddie asks his father to calm down, and George asks for a cup of coffee. When the attorney stands to get him a cup, George is flabbergasted that the attorney knows that the coffee cups are kept in the kitchen. (laughs) (laughs) When George gets the coffee cup, he is quick to detect that Helen didn't make this coffee like that matters. He's been here for a couple hours. He made coffee. They were in the kitchen earlier. I don't know what any of this implies. He thinks it's a gotcha that the attorney knows how to make coffee and he knows where people typically keep cups. I I think that that's what this is supposed to be. Right. But it's not very effective. Freddie and George wink at each other for some reason. Like, uh, hey, look, I caught your mom cheating. And then we cut to George arriving home to his warehouse. He finds a recording of a message from Cheryl on a tape recorder saying that she can't be with him and he leaves to find her. Well, she also left like food cooking yeah, and it's like burnt. Burnt. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like, what? She wanted to burn the warehouse down. Yeah. yeah. For the insurance money. Clever. Cheryl went to Bobby's fire station to apologize to him. Oh, wait, nope, she's not apologizing. She's here to offer an ultimatum to her husband who did nothing wrong. He gets angry that she's making demands of him, even though she's the one who cheated, and she tells him to grow up, and he pins her against the wall for a moment, telling her to take it back. Suddenly, the alarm goes off at the fire station, and we cut across the street to a phone booth where George has just committed a felony by calling the fire department with a false alarm. Also, Bobby and the other workers, uh, other workers, other firefighters are playing some kind of like, yeah, w- like RTS, like World War II battle game. Are they playing D and D in here, or are they planning a community that they're going to build or something? No, they're 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 pl- they're like recreating World War II battles and yeah. and have a they have like a point system assigned to like yeah. the the outcomes of these battles. So they're just playing like massive risk. Yeah, and yeah. also I'm pretty sure when he's yelling at her to stop playing the piano on the phone, he's talking to his friends about that stuff. He's not actually doing anything, you know. Like, he's, I don't think it's another job. I don't think it's a $5 million deal for anything. I think, I don't he's think literally it's a $5 million playing with deal. his friends. It just sounded like something important, and he was trying to communicate. It wasn't, though. It was like him, it was like him just talking to his friends. Right. But <laughs> I don't get it. I don't understand this movie. What is what is that? Why is that? Why are they playing a giant World War II because game? Because firefighters don't have anything to do 90% of the time. They have a TV in Lazy Boys. That's what you do at a fire station. My dad was a firefighter for a long time. I know, but I'm just saying this screenwriter thinks that they play with miniatures. Okay. 
I was fascinated though by this concept. <laughs> I was like, they're playing axes and allies for real with little models, and they have like a whole system worked out. I don't get it. The dispatcher on the phone tells George that the unit should be there in five minutes. Because George is just using a regular payphone, the dispatcher would know the exact address he's calling from and wouldn't have told him that it takes five minutes to cross the street with a fire truck. He walks into the empty firehouse after all of the firemen leave on their trucks and he finds Cheryl there alone. Because that's what you do when you... Is that is that standard procedure to leave the firehouse completely abandoned? No, uh, usually the chief doesn't leave on every on every run. And sometimes the whole firehouse wouldn't even leave on the same run, but... He finds Cheryl there, and she says, hey, we can be together now. And it's, like, super, like, nonchalant, anticlimactic, mm. like, oh, my, my husband left, but we had a bit of an argument, so we can be we can be in a relationship now. And he's like, oh, cool. That's great. Does this poll still work? You gotta try this poll. We cut to later as an organ is being lifted by Crane onto the second floor of his warehouse apartment for Cheryl to play. Freddie is helping them load it but then climbs down to leave once they get it inside. Cheryl steps back toward their bedroom and begins to undress as she disappears into the background, and eventually George follows her, and that's the end of our film. Thank God. I'm sure some of that money for Barbara Streisand went to their, her appearing topless. But she's pointed away from the camera. Right, right, right. But I still, can't imagine. Someone got to see the boobs. If that would take $500,000 off of her price... Then just say, I guess just leave your shirt on because it doesn't <laughs> fucking matter. You're walking away from the camera. It's a standard clause in the Streisand contract. Well, what's weird is that uh, usually her husband, John Peters, that shitty guy that was shitty on Caddyshack and a bunch of other stuff, um, was like such a hassle. And this is one of the first films that she made without his approval on everything. It seems just from the plot that they cut two hours out of this movie. <laughs> because none of the scenes follow each other logically none of the conversations make any sense i can't follow i feel like i don't speak english when i'm listening to these people talk our director here was jean claude tremont he wrote ash wednesday but this was his first american film and his last feature film he didn't recover from this i've never heard of ash wednesday is that a famous movie yeah um it's from the 70s uh, but it's it's at least highly regarded and he wrote it um our writer for this film was wd richter i can't explain his involvement with this film he had previously written slither nickelodeon the 78 body snatchers which is the best body snatchers last year he wrote brew baker huh and then he wrote this what five years later he would adapt the script for big trouble in little china from the original western version of the script to the modern day story wd richter is great and he i know must that have been drunk i don't know i don't i honestly don't think that they stuck to his script a lot i yeah. think they had to be making a lot of changes on set the whole time because none of it makes any sense like even just basic plot fundamental stuff doesn't make any sense and i know that they did a lot of rewrites when they brought streisand on because they were like oh well it's streisand so we have to have her singing in it and it's like this is what you chose this is how you chose to work in her singing into the movie yeah also, W.D. Richter did not write, but he directed The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. It's another terrific, under-celebrated film. What year does that come up? Uh, it's mid-80s, so we're not there yet. Music was from Richard Hazard. This was his last feature composing job, but he had previously orchestrated Xanadu last year. And uh, our other music credit is for Ira Newborn. This was his first credit. And uh, it was followed immediately with the scores for SCTV and Police Squad. He later scored a handful of John Hughes titles, 16 Candles, Weird Science, Ferris Bueller, Uncle Buck. His Police Squad score carried over to the Naked Gun films. And he also composed the themes for Dragnet, Amazon Women on the Moon, My Blue Heaven, Ace Ventura, and Mallrats. The original cinematographer, Tak Fujimoto, was fired and replaced with Philip H. Lathrop, he was the DP last year on Little Miss Marker and Foolin' Around, and he also did both Shirley MacLaine wife swap movies, Loving Couples <laughs> and A Change of Seasons. So this is his fault. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> Editor Marion Rothman did Beneath and Escape from the Planet of the Apes. She also edited 77's Island of Dr. Moreau, Orca, Christine, nice. Starman, Mystic Pizza, and Memoirs of an Invisible Man. So there's a few 
carpenters in there. I think it doesn't make yeah, any yeah. sense. There's so many people in this film that have decent careers yeah. here. Like I don't understand. I don't. I don't know what this, this is. Happened. Gene Hackman was George Doppler. He's Popeye Doyle in The French Connection. He's Lex Luthor in some Supermans. He's a Royal Tannenbaum. I think my favorite performance from him is uh, Herod in The Quick and the Dead. Really? Yeah. I really he, like that movie. And he's I, such a fucking terrifying weirdo in that movie. Yeah, he's he's good. Uh, I don't know what my favorite Hackman would be. I mean, I really do love the Superman movies. I know as cheesy yeah. as they are. He did not like them. Yes, he he definitely did not like them. Um, but I think that he was well cast as a Lex Luthor. Yeah. Barbara Streisand was Cheryl Gibbons. She's in Funny Girl, Yentl, Hello Dolly. She's in the 76, The Star is Born. She's Roz Fokker in Meet the Fockers and The Little Fockers. Diane Ladd played Helen Duppler. She's a three-time Best Supporting Actress Oscar nominee for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, Wild at Heart, and Rambling Rose. And she was also Ida Sessions in Chinatown. Dennis Quaid played Freddie Duppler. He was in Long Riders and Gorp last year. He's back this year for Caveman and Stripes. And later he'll be in Jaws 3D, The Right Stuff, and Inner Space. I honestly don't remember him in Stripes. I don't either, actually. When Even when I was reading it, I was like, was he? I guess he's in there somewhere. Probably just one of the guys. Mm-hmm. William Daniels was Richard H. Copleston. That's the attorney. He was Mr. Feeney on Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World. We saw him last year as Albert Einstein in The Blue Lagoon. He's also the voice of Kit on Knight Rider, but my favorite performance from him is Albert in A Thousand Clowns. Hmm. I like him in that movie. Terry Kaiser played the Ultra Save Day Manager. That's the guy who hands off the gun to Gene Hackman when he's working the night shift. He played Dr. Wackenstein, the mad scientist who put Paul Walker's brain into a robotic T-Rex in Tammy and the T-Rex, mm-hmm. but he's perhaps best known as Bernie Lomax in the Weekend at Bernie's films. He was in not one, but two Lois and Clark episodes as H.G. Wells. Chris Mulkey played Russell Monk. Who's Russell Monk? The security guard. Oh, okay. Uh, he was Vernon Biggs in The Long Riders, and he's also more recently Clay on Castle Rock. Stephen Peterman played Leon that's one of the uh, store employees, and he played the student that Hunter S. Thompson is getting drunk in court in Where oh, the Buffalo yeah, Roam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not going to talk. Uh, later, he was a writer producer on Suddenly Susan, Becker, Hannah Montana, and Murphy Brown. Richard Stahl played the pharmacist. He was Mead in 9 to 5 last year. He's back as Lester Hudson in Under the Rainbow later this season. Jesse Lawrence Ferguson was Jacob Horowitz. He was Black Electroid Commander in W.D. Richter's Buckaroo Bonsai. He was Eddie Black in Darkman and Calder in Prince of Darkness. Virginia Kaiser played Virginia. She was Mrs. Tuthill in Poltergeist, and I couldn't confirm it, but I suspect she is somehow related to Terry Kaiser, who, the Weekend at Bernie's guy. Irene Tedro played Loft Landlady. She was Aunt May in the late 70s Spider-Man series. She was also Mrs. Grimhouse in Midnight Madness last year. I think that's the woman who was really angry about oh, Leon about all the having all the people in his apartment. Peggy Pope played the waitress at the diner. I recognized her. <laughs> She's currently nominated for Supporting Actress re-Oscars by myself and Jesse for her performance <laughs> as Margaret in 9 to 5 last year at a girl. She's also Elvira in The Last Starfighter and Sister Angela in Choke. Hamilton Camp played Buggums the Bellhop. He was Grady in Roadie last year. He's back later this year as Lipschitz in SOB. He did the voice of Barney Rubble in the late 80s Flintstones. He was Greedy Smurf in 165 episodes of that series. He's also the voice of Fenton Crackshell and Gizmo Duck mm-hmm. on DuckTales and Darkwing. He was Meteor Burt in Joe Dirt. He's also in not one, but two episodes of Lois and Clark, also as H.G. Wells. <laughs> <laughs> what? I, I also like some of his The Tick voice acting. Who did uh, he do in there? Uh, he did a couple. He did Professor Chrome Dome, Benjamin oh, okay. Franklin, and Guy with Ears Like Little Raisins. <laughs> <laughs> That's the credit. That's great. I love The Tick so much. Uh, and the last credit here that I have listed uh, was probably cut out of the film uh, in those 20 minutes. But Charles White Eagle played Gibson Lone Wolf. 
uh, who is the guy that got kicked out of the apartment before Gene Hackman moved into it. And he played one of the Native Americans from the mushroom ceremony in Altered States last year. Those are all the credits I had for this one. Well, it's a down. It's a down. Definitely a down. For it's me. an infuriating down. Um, it's the, These kind of movies, they make me mad at everyone that made them because... They're all competent filmmakers? Well, they're, they're competent filmmakers, but I also feel like they're asking me to identify with someone or or to sympathize with someone in this situation and i don't sympathize with anybody i sympathize with bobby and i sympathize with helen those are the only two people who i felt like i could identify with in this movie i i have and we've had so many of these guys and gals cheating on their spouses movies i never sympathize with any of them yeah uh i don't know why this is an entire genre of film yeah but this movie especially they make gene hackman out as such an asshole that he gets caught doing it and he's like, well, fuck you guys. And he packs up his stuff and he walks out of the house. And it's like, that's really your response to getting caught cheating is like, yeah. well, bye. <laughs> and you just leave. And then they're like, okay, well, I'm going to ask for a divorce. And he's like, okay, cool. I don't care. And it's like, what kind of a crazy monster are you that you just sign away your, di- like, th- this isn't a conversation for you. You literally don't care about this woman who you were married to. Well, I also take that differently, though, because I think signing a divorce papers without looking at it can also be considered the kind thing to do because you're not fighting for anything for her. You'll give her whatever she's asking but for. But he's also not trying to keep her as his no, wife at all. But I don't think that that was the intent. I, think I agree. That he he wanted the divorce, and so he's just like, I'll give you anything. Just I think it's it's it. it's more insulting for your husband to do that and to make it seem like, I literally don't care. Just take whatever you want. Just please leave me alone. I never want to hear from you again. Yeah, I guess that is also very insulting. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's a down. Um, do we know where this is going letterboxed for you guys? Yeah, I struggled. I, I knew it was either going right above or below Harry's War because it makes about as much sense as... Another character yeah, that we couldn't like, sympathize with. Like, I don't with. know what is happening. I don't understand his motivation. Um, I ended up putting it below Harry's War because there were less explosions than Harry's War. Okay. And as we established, that is makes something better than something else. That's true. Richard, what are you thinking? Um, I have it higher, um, <laughs> only slightly higher than Harry's War. Um, I have it between uh, below Charlie Chan and above Earthbound, which puts it at number 16. Oh, I should say mine seventeen, which is uh, below Earthbound, or sorry, below Harry's War and above Pinball Summer. Okay, I have it in number twenty-two. It's the bottom of my list mm. because I was so angry at all the characters and I could not follow the writing. I I don't understand. Yeah. I don't. I can't follow the plot. I yeah. don't know what th- the characters mean to each other. I think these things make you a little bit more angry than they do me because you have to write the plot down and it, that's infuriating. Well, yeah, that was a part of it. But also just the, Gene Hackman and Barbara Streisand in this movie have zero chemistry. Yeah. They're, neither one of them ever expresses any kind of genuine interest in the other person. And they're both awful the whole time. And they yeah. both only care about themselves the entire time. So there's no reason these two characters would even meet, let alone end up together. Yeah. It's very much like nothing personal it's it's a lot like falling in love again last year with elliot gould where we're supposed to feel sorry for him and it's like why because he went and had sex with a prostitute on this vacation that he drug his family across the country for like it made me that angry again and that was the bottom of my list last year so i will be surprised if this recovers because right now it deserves to be below scream i would watch scream a couple times before i would watch (laughs) this again i i feel like there were some scenes in this movie that were like this movie wanted to be a stage production at some point, like him packing up his clothes and saying, giving his, this big speech about maybe there's too much nuclear waste or not enough nuclear energy. Like I can see like a, a, a like an actor, like shouting this stuff on a stage. Yeah. But, but in a movie, it makes no yeah, sense. It, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with this movie. Also, why is his wife learning French downstairs? Why does he have a conversation with the French tutor on his way out of the building? Right? Like there's, Everything in this movie is arbitrary and, yeah. and none of it like serves the story at all. Yeah. Again, and that, and to me that that is something that I feel would happen on the stage. 
Yeah. Like he, he encounters this other person and has just because the weird... actors have to be there in reality. Yeah. And because it, because this whole, the whole subplot concept of this French lesson and all of her friends being there. Friends that never appear before or after this scene. Yeah. To have this breakdown or wasn't it even that, that scene when at the, at the anniversary, when Bobby's flipping out and his mom grabs him and says, let her go. She's never She's, been one of us. Yeah. I was like, what does that mean? Because they want us to know Bobby's going to be fine. His family supports him and they never yeah. liked her, so that wedding wasn't going to work out anyway. But yeah. that's the only line we get to indicate that their marriage was a failure, other than that Barbara Streisand just is literally throwing her vagina at cousins for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Like, why is she hitting on family so consistently? <laughs> she didn't have to go see Gene Hackman at his grocery store in the middle of the night. She didn't have to do any of this stuff. Yeah. I think that's everything for all night long. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. You can find a button at the top of our .com and join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future. Also search for Vintage Video Podcast on YouTube and subscribe to our new channel there. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing The Devil and Max Devlin, which IMDb describes like so. Max, a dead, corrupt businessman, makes a Faustian pact with Satan's henchmen to drive three people to hell in exchange for longer life. Soon Max realizes that there still may be good in him. We leave you now with the trailer for The Devil and Max Devlin. Bill Cosby is the devil. Want a light? Elliot Gould is a shady agent. But I am very good luck, and I guarantee you will not fail. And the record business is going to the devil. Roses and rainbows, you better take They're swapping soul for rock and roll. Never been to the Grammys. The Devil and Max Devlin. That's just the way we like them. Rated PG. The Devil and Max Devlin, now playing.